Hi, I'm Patricia Greenberg. And I want to just, you know, dive into a subject that is serious and frightening for all of us. Cancer is a term that is so terrifying to most of us. And as an advocate for aging well, and hopefully making it to a ripe old age, I'm always encouraging people to please to head whatever you are faced with, head on, look at it fearlessly, because that usually is what will give you the best outcome. Um, in bringing survivor stories to the forefront, my hope is that I will bring awareness, help prevent and encourage early detection and proper treatment of this dreaded disease in all of its forms. I also want to help make the process less frightening. My guest today is Bill Potts, a five-time cancer survivor and one of the bravest warriors I have ever seen. He's a writer and executive marketing expert, Ironman, marathoner, and university lecturer. He is the author of Up for the Fight, How to Advocate for Yourself as You Battle Cancer from a Five-Time Survivor. Here is the book, and we're going to, of course, talk about that as we go. Welcome, Bill. Uh, hi, Patricia. Thank you for having me on your show. You know, there's so much to cover, and I would just like to start out with your story um, and how you first discovered you had cancer in that journey. Yeah, it started off 20 years ago. I went to my primary care physician, who was a new one. I'd moved to Houston, Texas, and uh, he came into the room and he looked at me and goes, uh, you've got a lump on your thyroid. I'm like, what? That turned out to be thyroid cancer. I had the thyroid removed. I went through radiation ablation treatment, uh, given the same radiation via, via pill that people get from uh, Chernobyl, iodine-131. Okay. I thought my cancer journey was over. Uh, but then in 2008, I'm now living in Tampa. I was diagnosed with stage three lymphoma and uh, had that handled with uh, immunotherapy and had a surgery. And then in 2014, uh, the lymphoma came back. In 2019, the lymphoma came back again. And in 2020, first I was diagnosed with prostate cancer and then lymphoma again. So six times uh, diagnosed, five times beating it. My latest uh, round of chemotherapy ended 19 months ago for the lymphoma. I'm still kind of beat up. My immune system is still a mess uh, from that. And we're going to kind of putting on hold the uh, prostate cancer piece until um, until later. Okay. And are these all related or you just got all three without any relationship? It just so happened. That's a great question. So I've had a lot of conversations with the doctors about that. I worked in the Department of Nuclear Medicine when I was in college, and it was pretty loosey-goosey uh, on the protection from the radiation back then. That hospital was subsequently closed, but the thyroid cancer most likely caused by exposure to that radiation. And then the lymphoma, uh, you hear about second cancers. Uh, that is potentially uh, a result of the radiation treatment I got for the thyroid cancer. So I do believe they're interrelated. It's hard to know for sure. The prostate cancer could be a part of that as well. But uh, for cancer patients that are going through uh, radiation treatment and even chemotherapy, sometimes the second and third cancers creep up as a result of that treatment. That's a very hard nut to crack, I'd imagine. Mm -hmm. You are near and dear to my heart um, mm -hmm. for, for your lifestyle. And, and mm. one of the old, you know, we're both marathoners. We're both tower climbers. I, I love your story. I love what you do. And I love how you take care of yourself, especially what mm. you're faced with. Um, and one of the age old misconceptions about how a person appears healthy can't possibly be sick. You know, never mind afflicted with something um, life threatening. So I, this is kind of twofold. You know, a wellness lifestyle, we believe, is supposed to stave this off. But does that also play into the denial that I'm healthy, nothing's going to happen to me, or I'm going to beat this because I'm healthy and I live a healthy lifestyle? Yes. So I do. I live a very healthy, active lifestyle, always exercise. My wife jokes it took me getting five cancers till I really cleaned up my diet, but it's never been that bad. Um, I've always been active. And so the, the answer is you don't expect it to happen to you because you're taking such good care of yourself. I don't smoke. I do all the right things. I exercise and then still get cancer. So yeah, it is, it is hard uh, to, to get your hand around that. I, I think initially it's, it's, it's less denial and more disbelief. It's like going through the stages of grief uh, when you're diagnosed with cancer. At first you're like, whoa, 
uh, it can't be me. Then you're like, whoa, it is me. Uh, but how could that be? But you quickly kind of reset yourself uh, once you get through that stage of, of denial and disbelief and you kind of start focusing on, on the journey to get better. But the healthy, active lifestyle 100% has helped me navigate this journey in a much more positive manner. I mean, clearly the outcome of having beat cancer five times is pretty unusual. Mm -hmm. My doctors think that that's been a big factor in my ability to beat it. Look, I know my cancer is coming back because I have incurable uh, lymphoma. So I work extra hard at trying to stay in shape so that when the cancer comes back, I'm ready for what I'm gonna go through. Case in point, I was going through chemotherapy in 2014 and, and my uh, heart rate uh, was being monitored in the hospital at MD Anderson in Houston and it, it alarmed because it went so low. So they turned off the chemotherapy and they paged the doctor and the doctor said, oh, no, 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 don't, don't worry about it. He's an Ironman. His heart rate's always low. Mm -hmm. And so it really does help you fight the battle better when you go into it in great physical shape. That is, you know, this is something that um, we didn't chat. We chatted a little before we got online about the questions, but that is something that I think you have to be proactive. I mean, you, Bill, and also all of you listening, that if there's an aspect of your lifestyle, you must tell the doctor everything you do. Mm. Don't hide anything, mm. whether it's healthy lifestyle or not healthy lifestyle. I think you must, it's really important to disclose everything because it's going to play a role in that. Because uh, you, when you get anesthesia or you get any kind of treatments and your heart rate goes really low or your heart rate goes really high, if you're athletic, that's going to play a role. So that's one mm. thing. Certain vitamins and supplements you might be taking can be counteracted mm. with what you're taking. So I just want to throw that in there is just really be honest, because if you're lying to the doctor, the only person you're lying to is yourself. The only person you're hurting is yourself. And if you could somehow get past that, maybe you sneak a cigarette once in a while, maybe you drink more than you're owning up to. Those are very important factors in your survival and your outcome. Um, during your treatments. So I think that that's um, something that people really need to be aware of. Yeah, as an example, I mean, I had the conversation with my doctor about medical marijuana use, mm -hmm. you know, for some of the nausea and some of the pain I was going through. Now, I wasn't prone to use it anyway, but I asked and he said, no, no, not, not for you, because we're not sure how that's going to interact with your chemotherapy. You know, we don't have studies on it. And if you do opt to use it, you got to let us know. And if you do let us know, you need to let us know where you're getting it. So it was a, a confluence of events that said, I'm not going to do it because the doctors are saying uh, the potential risk of the interaction with the meds. Bill, your work brings to light how important it is to really be present in everyday life, you know, work hard, face things head on, but also enjoy every moment. So mm. tell us how you dealt with, you know, you're married and you have three beautiful mm. kids and that's a, each kid is a full-time job. Marriage mm. is a full-time job. Your work mm. is a full-time job, your wellness. So that's a lot of stuff piled on top. Mm. Um, so how did that go with your family or how does it continue to go with your family? Yeah, it's really evolved. So when I was diagnosed with cancer 20 years ago, I've got three kids. Um, my, I had, I had an eight-year-old and, and twins that were four. So then it was trying to just live as normal a life as I could without communicating too much to them what was going on because they wouldn't really understand it. It wasn't really until uh, my third and fourth cancers that they started to get more of the uncut version of what I was going through because I felt that they could handle it. Mm -hmm. So not only did they start getting in, in high school, particularly when they're in college, they got the real, real answers from me about what was happening in open book. But we also at that point made sure that they had some outside support so they could deal with it without just talking with me or my wife. But I do think from uh, the patient perspective, each situation is really different, you know, based upon the child, based upon their age, based upon their ability to handle some of the things that I'm going through. In the book, uh, uh, two of my three kids uh, wrote a piece about that very topic, you know, how they dealt with it, which to me was super insightful. Uh, to hear it from them and hear it in their words. But uh, yeah, it's it can be real challenging, particularly with my wife, who has to be the caregiver for me. Think about how many times I've been in the hospital. You can't even count how many times I've been in getting uh, getting treatment for cancer or surgeries for cancer or checkups. It's unbelievable. And she's there with me uh, every step of the way. And for her, um, 
you know, her big concern was, well, what happens to me if something happens to her? So she was always uh, stressed about trying to stay healthy herself so she could care for me. And, and, and what we learned is that she needed to have her own life, needed to have her own friends, needed to have her own activities. Uh, she was busy working too. So she had to have a balance as well. But uh, yeah, it's, 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 a, it's, it's a real conundrum uh, how much and when to communicate with the kids in particular. You know, that is such an interesting point is that um, when it's 24 hours on everybody, uh, you do need some outside life. So who did you turn to for support outside your family? Because I, I can imagine that was a lot on them emotionally, physically, and just, you know, your dad and you're their protector. Mm. Life, you know, we all feel that in a marriage that that person's there to protect me and look out for me and be my number one. So I, I think at some point, did you talk to somebody outside just so mm -hmm. it wouldn't burden them? Yeah. Yeah, it's true. Uh, you know, uh, largely through my cancer journey, I've been super busy with work and I've had some pretty good responsibilities so I could I could lose myself in the work. But uh, yeah, faith leaders through a, a church I, I'm involved with. Uh, also, what's been particularly helpful for me, interestingly, is uh, Facebook uh, support groups mm -hmm. uh, for people like me. So I'm in a couple uh, cancer survivorship. I'm in one in particular for immunocompromised patients because you can imagine how challenging it is to navigate That's the COVID right. pandemic uh, without uh, B cells. So uh, yeah, and so we can kind of share things. For example, uh, there's a drug called Evusheld, which is made for people like me to try to prevent them from getting COVID because the COVID vaccines don't work. And so when I was needing to get um, uh, get some, it's super hard to find. I go in the Facebook group. Somebody says, "Hey, Bill, try this place in Miami." Uh, here's their phone number. Here's the person to contact, you know, and a few weeks later, I'm driving, you know, uh, four hours to Miami to get that uh, shot. So it's been super helpful. That's fantastic. Bill, uh, you know, uh, on the flip side, uh, along the way in this very arduous journey that you've been on, did you ever feel like giving up? Yeah. Yeah. It happened September 17th, uh, 2020 at uh, Mayo Clinic in Jacksonville. I couldn't go to MD Anderson anymore because uh, of the pandemic. They wouldn't want, they didn't want me to travel uh, uh, there. So I drove to Jacksonville and I had surgery to remove a major tumor from below my right hip. And uh, because of the pandemic, I was uh, only by myself in the hospital. So I woke up in the recovery room uh, and I was having a full-fledged emotional breakdown, not just like tears, but full-fledged. And so the nurse came over and held my hand and said, what's wrong? And I told her that I was not sure I was up for the fight, that I had a great life that, and I knew what was coming. I was wrong. It was worse than I had thought was coming, but uh, I knew it was coming and maybe it was time just to give up the fight. And so she smartly called in uh, the pastor for Mayo, and we had an hour conversation about all the reasons why I needed to continue to fight, which was for my family, you know, for my friends, uh, for my work. And and she goes, if you, and and to make, she says, you should make try to fight to make God proud. And so I told her, okay. So I was I was reconnected with the reasons why I needed to fight. At the end of that conversation, Patricia, she looks me in the eye and she goes, "Bill, you you need to turn your pain into purpose, and write a book to help others." And that's how the book happened, and that's how the name happened because it came out of that conversation where I said I wasn't sure I was up for the fight. Up for the fight is a is a fantastic name. How to advocate for yourself as you battle cancer from a five time survivor. Bill Potts is my guest, and we're talking about how to navigate our wellness and our futures mm. and all that comes with life-threatening illnesses and you're just a shining example of how to handle it on a daily basis. Can you speak to the fear and anxiety that comes with the diagnosis and treatment and even the aftermath? And, you know, your case, I guess, you, you know, you're on this roller coaster. Um, yeah, it's, 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 uh, yeah, it's it's a lot to unpack on the emotional side. And, and many times uh, the emotional side is really more challenging than the physical side, because a lot of the physical side effects uh, go away. But the emotional ones really don't. Those scars are, are there every day. I'm reminded every day that I'm a cancer patient when I take a thyroid medication to replace my missing thyroid. So it's an everyday thing, particularly now where I'm, I'm so isolated because of my immune system. I, I, th I think fear is uh, is is a reasonable uh, emotion, which uh, I have felt uh, often, particularly when you're uh, re-diagnosed or diagnosed again or before a surgery. 
Um, my faith is pretty strong and I've largely overcome the fear. I do get anxious uh, every time I, I, I go in for a treatment, uh, but, and, and before sc scans, I call it anxiety, yeah. but to before you go in for scans and, but here, here's what I've been able to do to deal with it. Uh, when I'm going to the cancer clinic to get treatment or whatever it is, I have a hard time the day before doing anything. I'm really pensive, very quiet, very, very introspective. People, my family knows to kind of leave me alone, let me deal with it. Once I once I leave the hotel room in Jacksonville and and and, and start walking across the street, it gets even more hard to walk in the front doors. But once I'm in the door, I treat it like a business, like my job to get better, and it's game on. And those emotions are just kind of tucked away, and it's remarkable what I can go through uh, with without fear and anxiety if I position it as this is my job to get better. Even so, I mean, my chemotherapy was was high risk, and I knew, you know, each time I walked in and was going to get an infusion, I, I knew what the risks were, but I wasn't really scared. I'm curious how your perception of yourself and the system and the interaction, do you have faith in the system? I, I the of number one advice. You. Yes. If you own your own journey. Okay. If you, if you advocate for yourself, it is almost a full-time job, uh, yeah. you know, on top of your full-time job, on top of your family commitments to manage your own uh, health journey, whether it's cancer or anything else. So you have to get second opinions. You have to do your homework. You have to know what drugs you're getting. You have to know the side effects. You have to follow up with your doctor. You have to be on the portal. You have to be communicating with them at all times. You have to be challenging them. You have to know the options that you have, you know, for your type of treatment. So it's true that I know that advocating for myself is the reason why we're having this conversation. Without it, I probably wouldn't be here Absolutely. because with my thyroid cancer, I was I was uh, told to get radiation treatment again uh, because they thought my thyroid cancer was back. That didn't add up to me. And at that point, I really leaned into self-advocacy and got a second opinion. And I do that every time. Mm -hmm. Even with somebody like an MD Anderson and a Mayo Clinic, I'm getting them to look, I'm getting them both to look at my at my issues to make sure I'm doing the right thing. But I know so much that, uh, you know, I know where the drugs are made. I know who the drug companies are. I'm not I'm not researching it via Google. I'm researching it, you know, very reputable scientific sources of drug companies directly, or I'm going to Leukemia Lymphoma Society. I'm finding the American Cancer Society, those, those articles that are vetted uh, about my particular type of cancer and what the treatments are. So I already know when my cancer comes back, I already know two or three options that, that we're looking at that we can try to get this thing knocked back again. And the doctors are uh, receptive to your feedback and they, yeah surprisingly they respect your position yeah surprisingly at md anderson in 2000 and 2008 with stage three lymphoma my first time with lymphoma they prescribed my treatment regimen uh and i told them no mm -hmm. and they're like no why no and i'm like because that particular regimen because i've done my homework you know it means i'm going to lose my hair and i'm in sales i'm in marketing I, I'm, I'm working hard i'm traveling I don't want to lose my hair because it's going to impact you know, my income. And so they looked at me like, really? And I'm like, yeah, really? They're like, okay, we respect that. So they got a team together. I almost missed my flight back to Tampa from Houston, but they came to me and said, hey, there's this thing called immunotherapy. You probably haven't heard of it in 2008. Really, nobody had until right. 2009. We're, we're, we're testing this thing. If it, We're developing it here. If it works, great. If it doesn't, you'll lose your hair and it worked. And were you, so, was that, were, were those trials, were they not approved? It was, yeah, it was a clinical yeah. trial. Oh, I, wow. I think that was okay. patient 23 in that particular trial. Wow. And so it worked for me and it was a real blessing. And so I learned then that no, they, they're open to the conversations as long as you do it respectfully. And as long as you've done your homework, the same thing at Mayo. I mean, we had these conversations about, do we do a do we do b and and it's it's remarkable that they're open to it um but did, did they feel urgent towards you bill you got to do this today or you're not going to make it you got to you got to listen to us you got to or did they give you time to think about it 
yeah, it's that gave me a little bit of time to think about mm -hmm. it, but I, I came into those into those uh, conversations pretty well prepared, so uh, we can make those decisions pretty quickly. It all depends on your type of cancer. For my particular type of lymphoma, it's it's slow growing, uh, so I have the luxury of taking some time to think about it. But I do that thinking about it kind of before that meeting with the doctor where they're prescribing what we're going to do, so that we can kind of get going on it, because with all cancer patients time does not go fast enough before you start getting your treatment. Right. So uh, we can move pretty quickly and they're used to moving quickly. So I can go from, from staging to a treatment really pretty quickly. That's, that's fabulous. Bill, you did some really fun things along the journey of life while mm. dealing with these enormous health challenges. And you did Ironman, you marathons, mm. competitive tower climbing, did you just go for it, not wear it, worrying about where you rank? I know a lot about ranking in, in, in competitive mm. sports. Or, or were you a competitive maniac? Yes, uh, competitive more than uh, just to finish, but competitive with myself. Okay. And so I was not trying to podium and be in the top. But what I wanted to do each time, if I'm going to do it, I want to do it great. And great to me means the best I can do it. So mm -hmm. example. Uh, training for Ironman Texas, and I tear a ligament in my foot. So uh, doing a half marathon, mm. uh, chasing somebody down, by the way, who I passed <laughs> and finished and had to hop to the finish line. But so I'm, I'm competitive that way. Yeah. But then it all of a sudden it changed my perspective of what I'm going to do for Ironman Texas, because now I'm in a boot cast where I think I was like 12 weeks. So I would take my boot cast off swim I would take my boot cast off and ride and I couldn't do a lot of training for the run. So when I got to Ironman, Texas, I knew it was going to be a painful marathon at the end of the 2.4 mile swim, 112 mile bike, then a marathon. And that particular day, it was a hundred degree heat index when I started the marathon, but I had a plan. And somebody asked me when I'm, when I'm switching from uh, putting on my running shoes said, Hey, are you going to be able to finish this race? And I'm like, yes. And they're like, well, how I'm going to, I told them I'm going to run. 26 miles, one mile at a time. Yeah. Each aid station was a mile apart. I'm going to do 26 one mile races and I'm going to finish. And I finished and, and I, and I had a, I had a great race for me. Did I podium? No, but I finished that race. It took me 13 hours and 41 minutes, but I did it. And the same goes for uh, like at Boston marathon, I'm running that race and, and I had, a, I had an injury. And so I was literally limping to the start line. And so my goal for that race was, do the best you can considering you have an injury, but don't rip your hamstring going up heartbreak Hill. Right. So I finished that race. It, it, it was awesome. And it was fun because I wasn't so much worried about time. I was a little bit, but I was mostly worried about just getting to the finish line. So you do all your research on your fitness as well as your health. So, uh, you, you know, you're on it and that's, that's very interesting taking that, that methodical approach that, you know, what your limitations are. Uh, but you also know your options. So it sounds like you've done that with everything. It's great. Um, really fantastic. Well, you know, I've learned so much through my health journey yeah. about how to handle the cancer journey because it's the same same process. Exactly. And one thing that stood out for me was your four-year stint at the Clearwater um, mm. Aquarium in Florida. I love aquariums and anything mm. in nature. My husband and I just did a nature vacation. Um, and you're around animals and nature mm. that don't have agendas and don't have time Mm. Uh, periods and eat when they're hungry and sleep or rest when they need to. Mm. Um, how did that experience affect your life? I'm curious how being around that, the effect. Yeah, in, 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 in a profound way. And so uh, I worked at Clearwater Marine Aquarium made famous by Winter the Dolphin from the Dolphin Tale movies. Mm -hmm. So I had the uh, good fortune of working at a, an aquarium that was about rescue, rehabilitation, and release. From an animal perspective, uh, Winter and I were pretty close, but Hope from Dolphin Tail 2 and I were literally BFFs. I played hide and seek with her every morning before we opened. So to have a dolphin as a BFF was pretty cool. Yeah, I went on rescues out in the water with dolphins, turtles, we rescued seahorses. So yeah, I got my hands dirty uh, there, which was remarkable. But what I took away most from the aquarium is the ability of the animals to impact people that are going through challenges as well, which which I use myself. Right. So we had a lot of kids with missing limbs come to see Winter the Dolphin. They were inspired by her story of losing her tail and swimming with a prosthetic. 
uh, Hope and Orphan Dolphin. So we had cancer kids, cancer adults, kids missing limbs, adults missing limbs, all sorts of challenges that I got to deal with on a day-to-day basis. And what it did is it really inspired me. The whole idea of winter can, I can, I related to my own life. This dolphin who lost her tail and was orphaned at a young age is, is living this life and inspiring literally tens of millions of people through her story. I'm like, oh, yeah, I can be more like winter. So it, it was it was the best uh, almost five years of my career. It was remarkable. Amazing. Amazing. Now, we talked we touched a little bit about navigating the medical system, but what what's your short list, if you will, of recommendations for people who are newly diagnosed, currently being treated, and maybe you're also on the other side and finishing up, so to speak. What, 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 what are some pearls of wisdom you can give us? Yeah, we'll go in order. And when newly diagnosed, the, the, the best thing to do is to hit the pause clause and uh, not communicate on social media about your diagnosis, because in many cases, uh, you know, the initial diagnosis isn't right, but you really don't want to communicate on a broad basis, uh, depending on who you are, maybe never, uh, to the big uh, to the big group on social media, what your issues are. If you're going to do it, you want to do it uh, once you have a good plan in place, once you've had your second opinions and you know what's going to happen, because uh, you're protecting yourself from having to answer a lot of questions from the emotion of others that are going to come to you uh, with unsolicited advice, with books, with take this, do that. You want to get your own plan in place before you start dealing with others for the newly diagnosed patient. Uh, advocate for yourself clearly. For those going through the journey, I think the best advice is is listen to your body. And here's a guy that always wants to be running or riding the bike or exercising that took almost 18 months off because my body couldn't do it. Yes, I would take short walks, but when you're fatigued, rest, Uh, tighten up your diet, Mm -hmm. uh, going through treatment to minimize the side effects. Uh, If you're going through it, get outside help, Uh, special help. Don't lean on your family for all that. Like we talked about before, Uh, get in support groups. If you're going through it, lean on the social uh, workers at, at your healthcare facility to get any kind of help you need. And if you're on the other side of it, uh, continue to take care of yourself so you can avoid another cancer. Uh, always listen to your body. Uh, always communicate with your oncologist if anything changes in your body so you can kind of get ahead of it if, if the cancer comes back or if a new cancer comes up or if not, so you have peace of mind that you're okay. So be ultra aware of what you're going through. And if you're on the other side of it, uh, try to live the most normal life you can and uh, try to live in the moment and enjoy every day that comes. Do you have a, a, a medical point person? Do you have one doctor that gets all of your records and all of your information? Do you have like a, a Grand Central Station for you? I do. Okay. I do. So I, I do. So every, all my medical records are on the portal. Uh, for the particular cancer center. So right now I'm being treated at Mayo. Mm-hmm. MD Anderson has the same thing. And even for my primary care physician, when I, I had to get a new one because my old one fired me because I didn't come to see him well, because I was going through cancer treatment, but hey, whatever. And so when I had found a new one, I gave him literally a two-page summary of my entire health history. Okay. So he knew everything. So when I got COVID, which for the first time I did, you know, a, a few months ago, we had a plan in place. And so I knew that, and he knew I needed to get Paxlovid the first day that I got it. And mm-hmm. that was a game changer for me. So yes, uh, all centralized and all the doctors know everything. So that's another thing, Bill, that I want to mention, even in minor conditions, all the way up to life-threatening illnesses, you must consolidate your, your, your issues, your medication, who you're being treated by, how long it's been since you've had something checked, right? I can't say that enough. And I think that's that's what you're saying is have it all together. It's like not knowing what's in your bank account or not is is always know your numbers, where you're at. How yes. often are you getting checkups at this time? I, I Right now I'm every six months oh, okay. uh, mm-hmm. for the lymphoma. Uh, I do about three months, I'll, I'll go do a lab corp at Walgreens. So I'll have them pull, do a blood check that I pay for myself. So I, every three months, I've got a pretty good feel for how my immune system is doing. So yeah, they're on it. And, uh, you know, for somebody like me that's been through it so much, uh, each time, uh, minus one time, I identify for them when my cancer was back. So in 2020, I called I called them, I called my own and said, look, my, I've, I've got cancer again. They're like, how do you know? I'm like, I do. Mm-hmm. 
That's amazing that you're at the point where you can actually. What do you say to patients who are terrified of the potential cost of their treatments? Yeah, it's a fair point. It's not just the treatments that can can add up. It's also for me, I gained a lot of weight, you know, through the chemo, and then I lost a lot of weight when I was done with it. It's it's the clothes. For me, it's travel, it's hotels, uh, it was airfare. And one, one time I, I flew to Houston 23 times in 24 months. Oh my goodness. So the advice is this, as soon as you're diagnosed with cancer, plan for a big financial commitment, no matter what. And even if you have great insurance, you need to plan for the other things. So plan for it, adjust your lifestyle because it's coming. Yeah. And so at, at the end, and also you need to meet with the social worker at your healthcare clinic and let them know, you know, what your, what your issues are for me early in my journey, when I was young in my early, early career, Southwest airlines was like, great. They yeah. helped me out. I worked with MD Anderson on vouchers for, 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 for travel, uh, leukemia lymphoma society, lymphoma society helped me out. So there's resources based mm-hmm. upon your particular cancer. Every cancer has a leukemia lymphoma society attached to it, right. lean on them and uh, see if you can find some help. But the most important thing is plan for expenses because they will happen. Right. Which goes back to planning for life, you know, is that have a plan in place for your life at all times so you're not scrambling and you're not living in chaos, whatever it is you're faced with. You know, Bill, we talk a lot about mental health and it is, you know, we're in a crisis in this country due to COVID and all the other stuff that's going on. Um, you know, it may not be getting to the people who need it most, I always say, the patients facing the potential threat of death. And I, I think that's the scariest um, aspect of all that. So how do you deal with that? And how do you recommend people work on that? The mental health side is uh, is is really complex and uh, you have got to get outside help. Mm-hmm. Um, you can't lean all inside and you know, there's plenty of resources out there, even if it's just uh, even even Facebook groups uh, can be super supportive. But mm-hmm. a professional therapist you know, can always help. Uh, we've leaned on that heavily in my family to kind of coach us through this whole journey. The, the piece, the piece on dying, it took me a lot of years to get my hands around that particular piece. But uh, I've, I'm not through my faith. I'm not afraid to die, but I do address that potential with my family by being buttoned up on all the legal stuff, by having a just in case file, if something happens to me, what what I, what, what I see and hear too often is that patients don't think about that piece and they're surprised with it when it's starting to close in on that time, uh, that they can't make it. And that's probably not the best time to get those things all in order. The the best thing to do is get that handled up front. You know, we hired a great lawyer to handle all those things for us and, 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 and to prepare yourself and your family for what might happen so that if it does happen, it can be a smooth, uh, it, it can be as smooth as it can be. So it's less of a burden when they're grieving. Right. It's tremendous advice. You know, Leslie, Bill, um, you know, let's let individuals newly diagnosed, struggling or have crossed the finish line know that they're not alone. I mean, I'm loving that you're saying this, you know, we, we can't say it. We can't say it enough that you're there for them with your book. You're sharing your story. I mean, every little bit helps. And, you know, I encourage people, like you say, whatever it is you have, there's a society or an organization that's there to help you. And there are good, wonderful people out there in the world mm. that are willing to do that. And, you know, lastly, Bill, I, I, you know, I want to thank you so much for joining us today, mm. sharing your story. And in closing, I want to ask what you like about getting older. Oh, it's great. You know, I, I've been blessed I love, with that. So, yeah. Yeah, mm-hmm. you know, yeah, I am. And so uh, what I like about getting older is I'm, I'm really appreciating each day and I'm living in the moment much more than I used to. Uh, it's part of my cancer journey, part of getting old, less time on, on, on my phone and computer and more time, you know, in nature with people, socializations where I can, which is usually in our backyard because of my situation. I, I love the wisdom that I have. So I've made so many mistakes along the way. And in particular, you know, my purpose, uh, I'm trying to live the rest of my life with significance and with purpose. And this book uh, has given me purpose. I never wanted to be defined as the cancer guy. 
That's not what I wanted to be defined. As. Now, ironically, that is what I'm going to wind up being defined by in many cases because of the book. But the book has given me this purpose to help others. And it's just remarkable. Some of these stories I'm hearing uh, about the feedback on the book and how it's changed their their outcomes and things like that. So um, yeah, that's what I like about it is the ability to take all that wisdom and help others. Yeah. And that's that's fantastic. Again, it's called Up for the Fight by Bill Potts. You can contact Bill at www.billpotts.com. The book's available uh, wherever books are sold and you can actually contact Bill directly. And Bill, I want to thank you so much again for being brave and open and sharing your story. I know it's helping lots and lots of people. It will continue to. And I, and I, and again, I wish you all the best in health and happiness for many years to come. Uh, I'm grateful to have the opportunity to chat with you. You do great work and are making an impact you. uh, with thank your work. You. Thank you. And um, so thanks Bill. And we'll, we'll talk soon. Yeah, yeah, and then the uh, the website's BillCPots.com. Bill Pots, excuse me, www.BillCPots.com, and we'll put that on our website. And those of you who are watching, uh, please subscribe to my channel on YouTube, Patricia Greenberg, The Fitness Gourmet, for more information about health and wellness as we age. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Bill. Uh, you're awesome. Thank you.